I had the only part that was actually 3D. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. 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 Okay. So basically, the whole idea of this presentation is that it's not going to be about 3D glasses, and it's not about 3D videos that you go and see the movie theater that are all the rage today. What we're talking about is taking bits and turning them into atoms. So what we are talking about is 3D printers and CNC machines and paper cutters and all these things like circuitry that finally, in this day and age, we're getting out of the virtual situation that we've been in for the last 30 years, where we're making MP3s and making movies, and now we're actually making real stuff. So it's definitely, the whole thing is about makers and maker spaces. It's about all these different electronics and hardware and DNA and medieval weapons and things that go boom. And that was from Tom Khalil of the White House. So the first way of getting things out of our computers, in the most simple way, in my opinion, is stenciling. This is a shirt that I made my nephew. Um, so it's a way of saving money, being creative, and I got him a nice Triforce shirt, and all it took was a little bit of screen printing ink and making a really simple stencil for him, and he loves it while he's playing the original Zelda. Uh, now, it can also be a little more complex. Uh, my buddy uh, does floors um, for various businesses. He'll do your garage if you need his business card, I'll get it for you later. Um, but so he's doing a dance floor at this new club that was opening up in Olathe. And so he had a picture of just kind of a design that was on a floor from a really cruddy picture. So I took that cruddy picture and I put it into um, just any kind of basic gym shop, any kind of Photoshop. And with that ability, you're able to make kind of a really symmetric, yet asymmetric, kind of perfect design. I then took a projector, a lot like this one, and put it onto two pieces of foam core, and then cut that out with an exacto knife, and he used that as a stencil to paint the, on the dance floor. So it's a great way of getting a design out of his mind, into the computer, and then back out again. So stenciling is some of the easiest ways to get that done. Um, and so in this case, it's DIY, DIY to make money, instead of saving money. So another way is that this is my uh, Romeo lantern I made last year. So taking any picture uh, from, the webs, from the web and then using GIMP Shop, uh, the posterized tool, to make it real contrasty in black and white, and then putting that picture on the side of a pumpkin and cutting out the highlights. So this is how I do my jack-o'-lanterns every year. The year before, brown back-o'-lantern. <laughs> He actually saw this picture, because uh, my friend works at the uh, Capitol, and he actually liked it, which I wasn't really what I intended. <laughs> okay, so, a little more advanced way of getting bits into atoms. If there was one thing I think that you guys would walk away with right now, um, and think that you could bring back to your library that's inexpensive, would be the Silhouette Cameo. Uh, it is a plotter and a cutter. This is what the Hype team uh, makerspace is using in Detroit. It's one of the first things they bought with their grant money. So um, you can use this to cut all kinds of various types of materials. You can make uh, cards out of it. And if you can see there on the side, it's so precise that you can actually use those little pieces that it cuts out in your design just as well. So for scrapbooking, those vinyl stickers that cost a whole bunch, or if you've ever been to like a uh, county fair and you see all the country kids buying the stickers for their truck, and paying like $15 for it, they can be making their own. Um, you can cut fabric pieces out. You can do heat transfers. You can even do uh, temporary tattoos with this. Um, one of the great things about it is that um, after I print out a color picture, the Silhouette Cameo can then align that image so that it can cut that same image out. Cutter, plotter, again, this is a little more advanced tool. I almost show you just to see the price difference. This is uh, something that's used for cutting wood. So this is $4,000, a little bit more than your 3D printer. But look at the things you can make with something like this. Um, a huge dinosaur, uh, kids' toys. This is actually was a 3D design for a printer, and this fella instead used it to cut out the wood. So that's actual movable gears inside there. All of these things are worth lots of money. You can sell them as artisans. Um, I have a friend who's a Lawrence police officer. This is not what he does day to day, but he spent something about that much money and he does it to cut reliefs and makes his own designs. He does it just because he likes to be creative and it gives him just that sense when he's not working at his job that it can really be stressful to be a release. So it is kind of expensive, but these prices are going down. Um, you can find CNC machines, that's computer numerical control machines that are routers. You can have them be lathes. Um, pretty much, it sky's the limit. Uh, they can cut steel, 
Um, wood is in this example. Place where people learn about technology and science outside the confines of work or school. Why are we talking about these in libraries? Papercraft. So another way. Uh, Papercraft was super popular right around World War II when everything, uh, rubber, uh, all kinds of different things, nobody could get their hands on. But paper, you could use as much as you wanted. So magazines would print out these things, and then people would go ahead and put them together. Well, with the dawn and age, uh, the internet where you can share all this information and really cheap printers, you can print out your own. So it could be simple things like the little kitty cat or uh, the spire flower from Super Mario Brothers or even a toy that moves. So the Paper Craft Museum is kind of the free open source community where you can find all these things. One of the best things about it is you can sort by how many pieces of paper it takes. So instead of being, uh, I don't want to try the first time I'm making something where it takes 700 pieces of paper, I just want one that takes five pieces of paper, you can sort by that. Uh, businesses, go figure, copier businesses are thinking, well, we should start our own because then people will print more. So Canon has their creative park and you can find lots of other prints the same way. And so really it's kind of like the commercial versus the kind of community driven sites, but you'll find both. And even some of the same designs kind of cross that. So Pepecura. Um, this, let's make paper craft models from three dimensional data. So what you can do with Pe Pepecura is you can take a 3D design, just like we're using to make uh, objects from a 3D printer, and then you can take it and it will show you how you would unfold it in pieces of paper. For example, on the left side, that's the 3D model, and that's how the pieces would be that you would cut out and the instructions for putting it all together. This is Yoda, he was probably like 5,000 pieces. This guy on the right started off as a paper craft model. He then uses Bondo and all kinds of other uh, lacquers and uh, epoxies to make this into something that he can actually stand on that helmet. But it was based out of paper because it's something that you can model easily and that's why they like it a lot because you can really work with it just like cardboard. It's quick and fast. <clears throat> so there's a whole giant community of this type of thing making all these and it really kind of goes towards the paper craft. Uh, props type thing. There's this whole argument if you get on their threads about whether or not what they're doing is art or not. Um, if you see the kind of things that they do, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that it is, uh, you know, very much so art. Um, but since they're taking a design, printing it out, a lot of them are saying, well, we're not really doing art, we're, we're crafty. But this is a really easy way to get into 3D design. And what does this cost more than you already have in your library or at your home right now? This is your printer already. It requires finding out what young people are doing after school and supporting it. What are they doing after school? Well, hopefully they're coming to our library. Um, so it's about bringing your community together and finding out what kids are doing and bringing them these tools and making them aware of things like paper craft or your silhouette cutter that you know um, that they might really enjoy making stickers out of it. So, how can you use video projection? Many of you already have video projectors sitting around in some closet, not being used except for when it comes time to have me or somebody else come to your library and do a presentation. Uh, so here's something that they've done to engage the community. Um, how they did this was kind of complex. They actually made a model and had spiders in it and videotaped it, and then take that video and project it on the wall. But it doesn't have to be as complex as this. I often think, uh, Connie's not here from Richmond Library. They love Halloween down in Richmond. And I thought, what a great idea. I would think this would really spark their imagination. So you can use video projectors as digital signage and lots of other ways that you can connect with people uh, after hours for your, when your library is closed as just uh, something that brings the attention to your library. This is the uh, astrological clock tower in Prague for their 600th anniversary. So in projection mapping, you're putting a projected image onto an irregular surface. So you're breaking up this image into lots of different parts 
and putting it on the image. And that's how they allow to do the things like they're about to do right now, where they separate the size of the building and show you the gears that are running behind it. This is actually not completely outside of your ability. Video projection tool is free and open source. This is a tool that you can download on your computer and it allows you to put that image and break it up onto different surfaces. So usually, like the clock tower in Prague, that was done by an organization that works in video projection. But that doesn't mean that uh, when your library has its 20th anniversary, that you all can't come up with something spectacular like that to kind of show your history or the building blocks building your library up. Okay, so what else? I love this video on the left. And since we're not running slow, we can watch the whole thing. So this is a whole video they made with those tiny little Pico projectors that are starting to show up on phones and has little snap clamshells for your phones. So it's just your typical cop chasing. But they're doing it in a different way. So um, another example would be this digital graffiti here. Um, what they use for this is they put a projector up on the wall or outside of a giant building, and then people with laser pointers, just like this one, but usually big, long, green ones, when they write on the wall, the computer draws that stuff onto the side of the building and adds things like that drip that you see there to make it more like actual spray paint. So there's also software available for that, to, for you to project on the side of your building, or even on the inside of your building to use for uh, you know, your programming for teens down in the basement or wherever you're putting those teenagers. <laughs> you know that's where they like to be. <laughs> so, I'm new to library world. But libraries started because they were things that they were at the library that you didn't have in your house, books. So now we have these things that we can't afford, like the 3D printer. Not everybody in the community can buy one. And they don't even know if it was, it's for them. They don't, until you get a chance to play with it and play with the software, you don't know if you're any good at it or if it's something that speaks to you. But that's what libraries have always been able to do, is bring these resources to people that they didn't always have. So whether it's that paper cutter that we saw or even a CNC machine, um, letting them use it, and finding out if they like it. And that was from American Library Act. So this is the Mickey Mickey right here in this little box. Um, what do they say on it? An invention kit for everyone. So what you get inside here is this little circuit board. This one happens to be broken, otherwise I would have shown you my banana piano. It's supposed to be getting here today. They decided to give me a replacement. Awesome community with this thing. I got it on their forum. I said, this thing's broken. What else can I try? Is there a reset? And some guy gave me an idea. And I was like, I tried it on another computer. I still can't find anything. Is it trash? Eventually, the person who does all their, uh, works with the company who distributes this, saw that on the forum. She says, I think you actually have a bad circuit board. It doesn't happen very often. Why don't you go ahead and email me here? 
and we'll get you sent out a new one right there. So awesome community. So not only do you have people with them helping each other, but you're even having the people who've developed it and designed it going back and checking on the form and seeing how their users are doing. So you get this yellow USB cord that plugs into the board here. And then you get these little alligator clips that you can plug into things like your bananas or your uh, uh, pencil drawing like they did for the Pac-Man. Um, really, the sky's the limit. And they, they, that's, that's the whole idea of this. Is it's not just about making a banana piano or a uh, piano on the stairs or Dance Dance Revolution. The idea is once you start playing with it, you come up with all these other ideas because all you're really doing is making buttons for your keyboard. So it's a way of making the user interface more adaptable to us as humans and not us just tapping away the keyboard. This was developed also, by the way, as a lot of these things are, um, from the MIT Media Lab. This is one of their, their projects they worked on when they were in their graduate coursework. Um, if you get into a lot of these maker tools, you start seeing how important the MIT Media Lab is to a lot of this development. Um, you could spend a lot of time. Uh, by the way, at the very end of this, I'll show you the link to where all of my uh, information that I've collected while working on this, and it's just you know, nichols.org slash makers is the home for all of that. So there's a bunch of links for all these different things that we've been talking about, and where you know what products we talked about, what community forums belong uh, that go with them. Any questions about Makey Makey? I know we're kind of moving quickly. It's cool. Yes, um, bought it online. Um, when you go to the Makey Makey site, you buy it directly from there. So it couldn't be easier. Um, this thing is a little pricey. It's about 50 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. But it's reusable, right? You get, uh, I believe, six alligator clips. Now, I didn't even tell you this. When you get tired of just using it with the controller pad thing on the front, you turn it around, and there's all kinds of inputs on this thing. So it doesn't just have to be the six alligator clips. Once you kind of get used to it and experience and you've kind of played the novelty stuff, there's a whole lot more circuit board stuff you can do here where you can plug it in. Um, there's a mouse emulator on here, so you could control a mouse movement with this thing. Um, that's why I say the sky's really the limit on it uh, once you start playing with it. Unfortunately, mine broke after about five minutes of playing with it. It doesn't make you very happy. Okay. Would you like that at Christmas too? Yes, that ruined my Christmas. <laughs> this is the Dradio, actually with a U and not a W. You can't buy the Dradio, well I guess you can. The Dradio is usually sold as a kit. Uh, it kind of goes back to the heyday when you read about Makerspace's evolution. You hear a lot about these heat kits that used to be really popular back in the 70s when people would actually build their own transistor radio. Same kind of idea. Um, so what we get, is this guy here. And I built this, and I haven't done a whole lot of circuitry. In fact, I've never done any real circuitry. I've soldered some lights and stuff on my, on my car or something that <laughs> broke. But with this, you're actually putting the transistors and resistors on the board. So you're learning to solder at the same time. Um, and then what you get So annoying, right? So then just like they did with that Atari thing, is you, what I find is you use this big graphite pencil so you can get lots of graphite on the paper, and you connect the circuit. So you know what your drawing sounds like. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a really obnoxious little toy. <laughs> no doubt about it. I mean, but it's, when you're the one holding it, it's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> just not very fun to listen to. Um, just go ask my roommate. You don't want to kill me. Okay, so here's the deal, though. I've learned about soldering while doing this project. I've learned about circuitry. I've uh, learned about, um, you know, just how electricity basically works. Um, so this is real problem solving. This is building. This is the whole idea behind a maker movement. So the whole idea, as we'll see later, is it's about not being so much a consumer, but you actually understand what's inside your device. You could buy something like this, I'm sure, from a Toys R Us um, that was all covered in plastic, and you'd never understand what it, 
what was going on on the inside. But with something like this, you actually do. This also came out of the MIT uh, Media Lab. Just like that. Actually, it's the same, same guys. As you can probably see, there's a lot of kind of relation to these things. They had the Dradio first. Um, and then, and then makey makey, which would breaky break. <laughs> um, so we'll, just since we have plenty of time, what are the tools you need to start something like that? Well, this alligator clip thing, super handy when you're doing soldering. This cost me a whole four dollars down at the hardware store on Mass Street at Ernst and Son. If you can find anything in there, <laughs> but it's still an awesome place to go. So this is handy. This soldering iron. These can range in price quite a bit. You know, I could go up to like twenty dollars, but you get a lot more from it. You get various tips um, and a little bit of solder. Uh, and that's really all it takes. I highly recommend you look at these kind of things, these kits. So, how to learn and build a flashing European sign? <laughs> this kind of stuff was more popular when I was a kid. Young, like thirty-six years old. So, when I was a kid, uh, really young, this kind of stuff was still popular. Um, it is, but it's not, ever since the day and age of computers and video games and all these things, people started losing interest on building them. It became a lot easier to go out and buy stuff. And it wasn't so much about, well, I can get my transistor radio, I make it myself, and I could never afford that, but now I've got a transistor radio. You'll hear a lot about that, too, when you read a lot about makerspaces or watch the webinars or get just involved with it. Um, just about how we kind of lost that as a culture in the last, say, 20, 30 years, in the day and age of the almighty internet. So that's what the idea is, to bring these bits that we've been so focused on back into atoms. Uh, another product from a university, this is Conductive Ink. It's not quite ready yet, you're not going to really find it for sale. But it's a silver-based ink so that you can draw circuits. So what those bright things are right there are LEDs. So they connect the battery, and just like the graphite works, but this is a little bit more of a stable circuit. So you can consider this a soft circuit. But, so this allows you to build circuitry very quickly and very easily. It takes away the scare factor of using a hot soldering iron, um, or I'm really gonna mess this up, kind of that fear that some of us have. Squishy circuits. I saw this on a tech top. This is something that you could go uh, to your kitchen tonight and make. It's just like the Play-Doh, basically, that my mom used to make instead of going to buy Play-Doh. Um, except for one conducts electricity and one resists electricity. Uh, another great tool about learning about circuitry. Um, you can build all kinds of circuits with this type of material. So it brings it down in age, so we're not worried about hot soldering irons. It allows, uh, you know, basically preschoolers to start learning about LEDs and batteries and how all of this works. And it's the instructions of our link to that to make this dough. I have not made it myself yet. Okay. E-textiles. E-textiles usually focus on one specific thing, and that would be conductive thread. So conductive thread is kind of what starts allowing you to build these, uh, also known as soft circuits. Um, you can put lights, motors on clothing. As you can see, there's lights on the shoes. Uh, there's things called muscle memory materials now. Um, so you know we can start making living organic clothing, bean bags, anything. Um, obviously, one of the things that's really important about e-textiles is that really mo goes towards the gender who often doesn't go towards uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This is a group that they're trying to reach. Um, usually they kind of feel like things aren't made for them. Uh, but let's face it, girls like clothes. I know that. I have sisters. Um, but they also like doing things. Uh, you'll often hear them saying that girls really like to decorate things, and that's kind of what leads them into video games and programming a lot. A lot of the coding and programming stuff kind of gets towards that because that's stuff that they relate to often. And I know this is generalizing quite a bit and not everybody's like that. But it is a way of getting to some people that might otherwise not have any kind of interest or think they might not be any good at it. <coughs> Didn't even realize that they would actually excel at it. And this book here is actually, I got my 
sister-in-law two Christmases ago. He's got some really great you know, starting projects. My sister-in-law had about as much interest in e-textiles as you know anybody else that's in the library right now that's never heard of it. She didn't care about it. She didn't even know about it. But I knew that she really liked crafting, and she always makes my nephew's costumes every Christmas. And I was like, she's got to see this e-textiles book because she's the perfect person when she's building these praying mantis costumes for my nephew. They like to add, you know, blinking lights, and you know, one day, you know, happens to the praying mantis legs move on their own, that kind of thing. Okay, so circuitry, more and more. The makey makey. You guys already know what an Arduino is, even if you don't. That's what a makey makey is. It's based off Arduino. Um, so all it really is is a circuit board um, that allows inputs to be then turned into some sort of output. That's all the makey makey is doing. It gets an input from you tapping the banana, and then it then sends it to the computer as a keyboard push, as you hitting the letter W key. Um, there's anything else I wanted to definitely make sure. Of. Okay, Arduino, this is what they say about it. They don't say it's a circuit board. They say Arduino is an open source electronics prototyping platform based on flexible, easy to use hardware and software. It's intended for artists, designers, hobbyists, and anyone interested in creating interactive objects or environments. It's not made for scientists. It's not made for grad students. It's made for artists and hobbyists. That's the kind of things you're starting to see more often is that it's not so much this niche group. That's one of the wonderful things about where we are in technology right now is that things are starting to get easy enough that the creative people can start lending their senses to it. And that's when really the magic starts happening um, is when you can get that creativity pushed into it. So Raspberry Pi, I've heard about a few times today. What is it? It's a Linux computer. It's a credit, size, credit card sized Linux computer. So why is it important? Well, it's important because first, it's super cheap for a computer. $50. It hooks up with things you might already have, like your TV, uh, a keyboard and mouse that are extra, and a network cable. You then have a computer. Um, well, it's also important because it's a super tiny computer. What can you start doing with things when they're the size of this, a whole full-blown computer? Uh, you know, it can fit into weather balloons. It can fit into robotics. And just like with any of this, you're only hampered by your creativity to use it. has been around for a couple of years and basically it's to try to reach people and bring them into the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, it was getting a lot of bad press when they first started. The reason being is when they first started this program they were really trying to do it as a one-size-fits-all top-to-down program and what you find with these types of things is it doesn't work like that and now you're starting to see that they're embracing maker fairs and maker spaces. They're starting to embrace it from a bottom up, a not one size fits all, a you know, very particular to you type of way of reaching you. So that's why this program is important right now. Um, it's also important to this quote to me because it says it's a combination or a collaboration between companies, foundations, nonprofits, science and engineering societies to enable young people. So it's a group effort to do this. It's not just one tech shop that you know makes money for their membership it, and it doesn't necessarily mean that nonprofits or libraries are in it alone but it's a group effort to get to kids but it's not just about kids either I mean how many adults do we know who have no direction in their life <laughs> I was one of them okay 3d printing that's what we thought we were going to talk about the whole time so 3d printing is in the uh, age uh, it's very similar to where printing, desktop publishing was in around 1985. Remember what printers were like in 1985? <laughs> so, it's still super early for 3D printers. However, uh, as you guys, if you went down there, you can see some of the things that we're able to do. 3D printing allows really for the almost the first time additive manufacturing. So almost everything we've ever done, as far as the industrial revolution ever goes, we've always been doing subtractive manufacturing. We cut things out, and then we're left with an object. 
Every once in a while we did some additive things like welding rods together and stuff like that. But really, this is the first time we're building it something up. Uh, the MakerBot Replicator 2 is what was down the hall. Uh, it's $2,200 basically. Um, talk to Meredith, about three grand would get you set up with all the equipment you need. Um, the Cubify was featured at South by Southwest. It's a little bit cheaper. Um, so there's lots of different types of 3D printers. Some of them are more kits where you build them together. Some of them uh, are more expensive than this. Uh, the thing to think about is desktop 3D printers. 3D printers have been around for a long time. It's that now they're the desktop model. Same thing when we were talking about the CNC machines. It's now we're talking about desktop models. So that means that the every average man, the guy that I mentioned who's the Lawrence police officer, who that's not his field, he's not a carpenter, but he can buy that and have that in his workshop. Uh, Okay, so some of the great things about 3D printers that I was kind of talking about it when we were in the room is the scalability uh, and the customization of these designs. I can get a design off the internet and I can change its scale so that it fits my needs. I can shape, I can get download like a, he always uses this example of like a lamp, um, like a lamp shade. And you can take that design and tweak it so it's in your liking. Um, so that's one of the benefits of it is you get to really customize these things when you're starting to do 3D printing. Uh, that opening software thing that I showed you was basically can turn directly into a 3D print. So this software, as long as you have the 3D data, you can create your own 3D print, uh, printout. Uh, and I would say, you know, there's definitely a learning curve with that type of stuff. Um, it's probably easier for your average person to start by going to a site and downloading uh, in, uh, 3D data and then start printing it, picking out their favorite things. And you will find stuff uploaded that has to do with about every kind of subject you can think of. 3D scanners, so desktop scanners. Um, they're not really quite here yet. Um, in six months, um, they you'll see like at least two brands I know that'll be shipping by then. MakerBot, who was the replicator producer, they're putting a 3D scanner. So what does a 3D scanner allow you to do? It allows you to take an object and then share that object with everybody across the world for all time to see. Um, so it's just, you know, of course I always think of like the Star Trek replicator type thing. I mean, that's, that's the part of how you get the information <coughs> in. Um, you don't have to necessarily build it this complicated software like I was talking about. So if you had some sort of figurine or, you know, some sort of uh, architectural feature that you wanted to share and preserve, you can use something like a 3D scanner to then share that with everybody else and then they can print out their version. Okay, so now we're talking about 3D modeling. How do you make it? Um, probably one of the easier ways to do it is SketchUp. That used to be owned by Google. It's now owned by Trimble. Um, it's a really good tool for beginners and intermediate users to start making this 3D modeling software. Um, it starts giving you the language of what 3D modeling uses to be created. Uh, it also works really well with products like Google Earth. Uh, I was just reading an article last night about this guy who was using, uh, Google Earth really wants to flesh out all those flat buildings that you see from the flyover view. And so what they're using is this product, or products like it, um, to then build what those actually look like in three-dimensional form. So it's, it's definitely, if I were to start with somebody that's never used any kind of 3D modeling software, I'd probably have to start with this. And build a square, or a cube, sorry. I'm thinking too much one. Okay, Blender is what I use for the opening sequence. This is open source software. And open source seems to always have these great communities behind them. And that's no different with Blender. Uh, tons of forums for it. If you're having trouble for uh, trying to figure out, like, how do I animate this thing that I just made? You're gonna to find tons of resources. There's also a bunch of plugins. Because it's all the code's open source, then anybody can make a certain plugin to do whatever they want. So I highly recommend, you know, if you've got somebody who's, you know, seems really smart with design and they've never tried 3D modeling, you know, get them started with SketchUp uh, and then definitely, you know, let them see Blender. 
I had a lot easier time jumping into Blender because I've used software like Maya before, and Maya is a professional animation software, basically. Uh, stuff that they use like to make Toy Story. But you can actually do that with something like Blender. Okay. So, Autodesk, makers of CAD programming, been around all my life, super specialized for the professional. Uh, well, now they're branching out. Um, most of these are apps either for just the iPad or iPhone. A lot of them have their uh, PC components too. Uh, so they've made this whole range of apps that have to do with 3D modeling and 3D printing. Uh, the first one is Catch. I told you that like desktop scanners really aren't there right now, but what Catch does is you take several pictures with your iPhone or iPad, and then it takes all those pictures and groups them together so that you then have a 3D modeling image. It's really awesome to see, uh, to go through and take a picture of like say, uh, you know, a sculpture from every bit of angle that you can. And then what you have on your iPad is this image that you can turn around and look at from every angle. You can even get on the inside of it and look out at space if it's a, if it is a sculpture person. Uh, sculpt is virtual clay. You start off with basically a ball of clay and then you push and pull on your iPad to make something out of it. Uh, that's a free one, that's a free one. One, two, 3D Creature is new and it kind of works with Sculpt, it is not free and that gives you all the added benefits of doing things like adding scales and teeth. Um, so you get to make little monsters with it. But it is, it's pretty much just like Sculpt, the same kind of idea as you're using you know, really human type sculpting tools, you're pushing, you're pulling. One, two, three design is a 3D modeling kind of beginner software, kind of like SketchUp, but it's something that you can use on your computer or your iPad. And then one, two, three D make um, is the software. Whenever we're talking about 3D printing, we're taking the 3D data and we put it in the printer, but there's an, there's an intermediate step between that. What we have is what they call slicer software. Slicer software takes this 3D image and it tells the printer how are you going to build that. It says, is the inside going to have some sort of honeycomb on the inside for support? Is it going to uh, be completely dense? Uh, so that's what 123D make is. It's basically the slicer software. Autodesk has paired with MakerBot, so they're partners now. So I can take this data and I can have it be created on my MakerBot very easily. Um, they also partner with lots of companies who will print your things and then send them to you. And that's when we get to services. Um, instead of services, we could almost call these marketplaces. That probably is a better term. Um, so there's four, I think, kind of main ones. Shapeway is actually the one I think I hear about the most. What these services pretty much all allow you to do is they allow you to upload, upload your 3D data. They allow you to look at other people's data, so it's like a gallery. They let you download that data from other people. You can have them create something either from your image, or not image, data, or somebody else's. And they'll usually do this in lots of different materials. Um, they'll do it in uh, multicolored sandstone, they'll do it in metal, plastic, um, really there's tons of materials they'll do it in. And they obviously charge you quite a bit, usually, for uh, creating those things. Which is nice when you have your own 3D printer and can make it yourself because these services are pretty expensive. Okay, so resources. Uh, Fangiverse is kind of the community for MakerBot. Uh, it's been around for several years, I think about 2008. Um, so it's got a huge amount of uh, 3D data, objects that are on there that you can download from or you can add to it. And then just like all these other communities, all this kind of feedback back and forth to share. Uh, Facebook and Google Plus are actually great places to learn more about 3D printing. Uh, there's tons of communities. They're not all library centric, but some of them are about maker spaces in libraries or 3D printing. Uh, Make Magazine is, uh, you know, you could give a lot of credit to Make Magazine about where we're at with the maker movement right now. Uh, 
they've really kind of led the way since their publication started. Um, they give you all kinds of different projects to work on, um, resources to, grow, uh, to kind of grow with, um, kind of behind the maker fairs that all started across the country. Uh, 3Dears.org uh, claims to be the source for 3D printer and printing news. So, and there's a ton of other resources too, and of course those will be listed on the website are already there. So this is something that I feel very strongly about in general, because I've always been a maker in my life. I didn't even realize that's what it was. I had my dad's workbench down in the basement, and I would play with his tools and probably almost shoot out my eye over and over again. Um, I would take things apart all the time <coughs> to see how they worked, and usually didn't even learn about much how they worked. But you know, it was always something that I cared about a lot. And you know, when I think about how there are people out there who are out of work, who are underskilled, who haven't even you know, decided if they're going to go to college. In this day and age when junior highs and high schools no longer have tech shop anymore, um, as technology gets a lot easier to use even, we become more distanced from what it's actually doing. As we start having iPads and apps and all these things and technology starts to be about Facebook, then you're no longer learning about all the things that are going underneath. So it's a call, and I'm glad that Obama sees that, you know, if we were a nation of tinkerers, then we would also be, you know, have a commodity worldwide to share. So it's really about, you know, as patriotism and about the United States and about where can, you know, what, what can we make of our country and our infrastructure. And really, I'm thrilled that people are starting to kind of embrace this makers movement. And I'm super thrilled that at Nichols I get to kind of be the makerspace guy. It's pretty awesome. I had no idea that you know that was even something when you know two years ago. So um, you know, if you have any questions, uh, definitely at any time, even if, if it's not right now, you know, drop me a line. Um, I know Elizabeth was just talking, uh, you know, about what, what would it take for us to get a 3D printer, and you know, couldn't we just share one between the four libraries of you know Southern Kansas City? Well, it seems pretty doable. So, you know, definitely if you need more feedback, let me know. Um, and I would love your feedback too, because I'm going to be doing this presentation in some form uh, at the uh, Library Information Technology Association's meeting next fall. Yes. Well, the good thing is that most of them have awesome communities behind them. And so really you just kind of have to put them out there and let them try. I mean, really the first part of it is getting in there and getting your hands dirty. You know, it's like you don't have to be amazing at it the first time. You know, if I want to learn about circuitry and I want to buy a kit, you know, if it doesn't work, well then that's a learning experience too. I found out, well, I'm not very good at circuitry. I need to get better at soldering. Or, you know, I need to be more careful and follow directions better next time. But really, almost each of these tools has, like, just like the paper craft, huge community of things. And there's all kinds of threads uh, that go online of, like, hey, like, there, there's the one about the Yoda, that Yoda picture. There was this guy, they're like, I didn't even tell you about what they're doing with that. Okay, so, <laughs> little backstory, real fast. When they get those pictures, or when they get that image, what they're usually doing with that paper, uh, pepper, pepper cura, is they're taking 3D data from video games and pulling it out and then building those things out of paper. So, because video games are all, all the characters are made out of polygons. So they strip that data out of there. Well, what I saw in the Yoda thread was, because this was data that came from a video game, the part right here in his armpit didn't quite match up. And so this guy's like, hey, you know, my Yoda, the face looks great, his robe's working really good, this thing's about this tall. The time they probably spent on this is like a month, at least. And he's like, but I can't get the, arm to fit right. And then there's, you know, a huge long thread of people like, well, I would, you know, suggest go ahead and put the road part together, build the arm separately, and then kind of attach it to the side. So, I mean, you just kind of have to get, and really, this whole thing is about getting people that are interested in the same things together. 
So it's not about, oh, I'm the librarian, I'm gonna teach you guys about how to use a 3D printer today. It's about, there's a guy in our community who's been doing this stuff for two years already, and I'm gonna bring him in, and he's gonna be your mentor. It's about bringing like-minded people together so that they can share that information. Make sense? Anybody else questions? Yes. Are you familiar with Cookie Caster? Cookie Caster, no. Heather told me I should mention it. <laughs> It's, Heather said, if you want to reach these people, tell about cookie cash. Well, everybody, whenever I talk about 3D printers, somebody's like, well, give me a practical example. Right. I'll let you say what cookie okay, cash is. Okay, so cookie cash that Heather told me I should say, and he reminded me. So what do I do with 3D printers today? The, you know, right now the resolution stinks on them. Um, you know, they might not be very good for replacement parts right now, because like if I wanted to make a part for my dishwasher, because maybe it would break. But what they're finding, a really popular service, is to make these customized cookie cutters. So that's what cookie cutter is, is, is that, yes? How do you control people from making things they should make, like dead parts and knives? You know, I mean, how do you ever control people from doing that? You know, it's, uh, haven't, haven't people always been able to do things that they weren't supposed to do? Um, you know, you're, by giving people knowledge, you know, you're not necessarily saying that I'm responsible for what they do, in, in my opinion. I mean, and, and we're not teaching people how to build bombs, you know, it's, we're not putting, and that information is already out there. Um, but what you are doing is, learn, is people are learning skills, and hopefully, this is the case, hopefully when people start learning about things um, and start becoming productive members of society because, hey, I've got a skill now, they're not gonna wanna do things like that. You know, that's the hope, um, in my opinion. It's sort of like uh, an age of invention. Definitely. And this maker's book, if you guys haven't read it yet, you should definitely get the audio book or read it. Um, yeah by Christian Anderson, I think. Um, he talks about his grandpa. His grandpa was an inventor when he was growing up. He, he invented a sprinkling system. But he was never able to be the person who was selling it. He was never an entrepreneur. And so what they're saying in this day and age, not only can you be the inventor, but you can be the entrepreneur too. You don't just have to develop a sprinkler system and then sell it off. Uh, another thing they say is, there's no more in the new age general electric and all these other giant corporations because everything is so specialized and customized. That's the future. But you're right, it is. It's an age of inventing, again. Um, they call, they're referring to it a lot, uh, at least in that book, is the third industrial uh, revolution. You know I have so many questions. Um, first thing is, um, we can't afford a maker bot and all of that right. in a small library. So what I was looking toward was building our own. Yeah. And I know that there are instructions. Mm -hmm. And you know, you follow instruction, you put things together. It can't be that difficult. There are some really dumb people that I've seen that put these things together, and they yeah. work. Right. But let's say a library only had maybe $250 to spend. Yeah. What would you suggest that you start with? Um, I think that that material cutter is a good thing to start with. Um, because then you're dealing with things like fabric and cardboard, and you're starting to get to experience these things, um, that it, you're starting to deal with 3D data. You could just as easily use that material cutter with paper craft to cut out all those parts for you so that you're not sitting there with the design. So, I mean, I think that those are some great entry, entry you know, tools. Um, another thing I think is, uh, you know, finding, maybe all these things can't be in the library. You know, some of them are loud, some of them are dirty, some of them are dangerous. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't provide to them, hey, did you guys know that there's instructions for building your own 3D printer and having a whole section of, you know, the, your library dedicated to that so that people are aware of it. But, you know, I would, having never built a 3D printer from instructions, I'm not going to sit there and say it sounds like the easiest thing in the world to do. Um, but it is possible. But I've seen them where they've even used glue guns as the extruder to right. get up the filament. Right. I mean, I mean, it's why not? <laughs> I mean, what are you what are you really out if it fails miserably? Everybody that was involved learned something they that they didn't know before, and the next time they do it, they're not going to make the same mistakes they made before. Um, and you can also then. Put all that information up on your website so that the next person or on you know the, the, the forums that go along so they learn from your mistakes too. I mean, there isn't really unless you're you know 
breaking bones or burning down the library or you know the community, you know what's the worst that really happens? Um, that's kind of my opinion. I mean, my house in Orland Park that my dad lives in is still standing, and I don't know how many things you know I did that I should have never done. Anybody else? Yeah. The thing that I, I was reading about the Cricut machine, and it is cheaper, it doesn't seem like it really gives you the customization. You're pretty much downloading these patterns um, and then just printing them off and buying them. So if, if it was me, I'd buck up the extra $100, $150 and get something that you could actually take your own designs and start creating. That's more of a, in my opinion, kind of, you know, cookie cutter, you know, kind of example. And it, I mean, it's definitely for scrapbookers. There's a money-making thing for scrapbookers, you know? And if you're gonna put that much money into a product, you might as well make a product that can be used for vinyl stickers, temporary tattoos, and all this stuff, you know, that yeah. is kind of hot right now for team spaces. So then you're talking about the silhouette cameo? Yeah, that's the cutter I was talking about. Um, and, and there's a lot of plotters out there and cutters. It's, it's you know, it's not a really new technology. What's new is the price and the size. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys.